I'm going to be talking about light, space, and water. In, in regards to Edmonton, I think the three, when I look at what are the gaps in the marketplace that are not being catered to, it, one of the obvious things that stands out to me is the palette of darkness that we have. It's an incredible palette of darkness that affords us an opportunity to do something really special. This started a few years ago with crowdsourcing the Light the Bridge campaign for the high level. I think we can all say with enormous enthusiasm, this has been transformational for Edmonton. It showed us what we can do with a little bit of light. We can illuminate other infrastructure. It can be underpasses. It can be other bridges in the city of Edmonton. All kinds of different corridors within the city of Edmonton where we have infrastructure. There's such an enormous opportunity when you think of six months of dark and what that could mean to a city. We think about Brad in his example talking about marketing. Well, what about marketing us as something that's unique to this place? We could become the city of light that's world renowned for embracing light. Architectural lighting on buildings. We see what it does to very interesting, handsome buildings in this photo, but it can also do incredible things to blank walls. We, can, we know that in this city, unfortunately, there's no shortage of disposable architecture. There's no shortage of blank, boring buildings that have not much on the side facades of their buildings. And it affords us an incredible place to illuminate public art, to do something whimsical, fun, magical with light. And LED technology doesn't cost that much anymore. For pennies, you can pay to light an entire evening, an entire, entire facade of a, a building. And when you can use light now to transform all kinds of different spaces. It can be used in terms of public art and interactive space. It can be used in terms of wayfinding. We think about wayfinding in a city that's at 53, 54 degrees latitude. And we often put up signs all over the place. But we don't think about how we experience those places for six months of the year. And we need to incorporate light into them. We need to also have fun with it. We need to do something that's unique and memorable, have enormous uh, I think we need to flip what we're doing right now with summer festivals and spend the same kind of money on winter festivals and put it into things like, things like light displays and competition with light, that we could have some enormous success with this if we were to do something that could start at 5 o'clock in the evening and go till 2 o'clock in the morning. We see what that, what's happened with Nuit Belange and the most successful art installations were the ones that involve light. And I think the reason that it really resonates with people is that it plays to who we are which is a dark northern city. It's playing to our strengths. It's very authentic, and it's of this place. And I think when we think about branding and transforming the city, it has to be exactly that. It could be interactive art, ones that when you walk on it, it senses, it's got heat sensors in it, and it changes colors. Kids love this. It becomes magical places to walk through. Likewise, we think about the city in terms of the darkness that we have in some of our corridors that are not very well illuminated. And what you can do now with technology, smart technology, that lights up and changes color if they're not being used. And we could even extend as far as street furniture, like this one in Sydney, uh, Australia. Because in, in Sydney, they did something really fun, which is how do you take regular conventional furniture and do something different with it? Unfortunately, Edmonton has three to four million square feet of office space right now that's unused, that could grow by one to two million more square feet in the future. This is one of the earliest office buildings built in Edmonton, the McLeod Building downtown. It was converted by Gene Dubb about 15 years ago to housing. I think we need to do a lot more of that. The conversion of these spaces really kind of started in the 1950s. We think of Soho, which really took the, the start of the whole phenomena across the globe of taking warehouses and, industri warehouses and urban areas and started transforming them into housing. That next big panacea, that next big super meta trend is going to be converting office spaces that are B and C into housing. And we need to do it for people like students, seniors, and social housing in the form of permanent supportive housing. One million square feet of housing, one million square feet of office space can equal 2,000 people. We have three to four million vacant right now. So you think about what that can do. And the best part is it's where you want to put people. It's where the transit's located. It's where the greatest investment in public infrastructure has already been put. The libraries are there. The jobs are already there. The river valley's there. It's exactly where we want to, uh, where we want to be. And so we need to look at creative ways for public-private partnerships to transform these areas into small, little, affordable units that cater to permanent supportive housing or seniors 
And so we could add in the near future the capacity for 12,000 more units just in the heart of the downtown that would help the city of Edmonton in terms of our tax load as people will invariably challenge their taxes. The next and my last final big idea is to embrace the water, to develop a true waterfront district in the heart of Edmonton. I think that our River Valley is wonderfully successful for the Lycra crowd, but if you don't enjoy Lycra, <laughs> head to toe, it's not as accessible as it should be. We don't touch the water like they do in Chicago where I was two weeks ago. The Chicago Riverfront, Riverfront is unbelievably successful. People love to go there, they love to have dinner there, go for walks, cafes, buskers are there, and it's frequently used. We're one of the only major cities that I can think of where we don't have a relationship with the water, but we do exclusively to the River Valley. There are lots of great examples like Oklahoma City and there's also San Antonio that have developed canals from scratch. These weren't canals that got repurposed like the Lachine Canal in Montreal. These are made from scratch that have become the it places in Oklahoma City and San Antonio. They literally dredged a canal and it became possible. The other big idea is to put a weir on the North Saskatchewan. By putting a weir on the North Saskatchewan, we'd raise the water level high enough that you could have water sports, you could have surfing, kayaking, uh, you could have all kinds of water sports upstream because you would actually have proper water levels for boats and other things to go down. Right now, we don't even have enough water to do that. If you've ever canoed it, you've probably had to drag your canoe for quite an extended period. And by having a weir on the river, we'd actually be able to do river skating and have winter festivals right on the North Saskatchewan like they do in Winnipeg on the Red River or in uh, other cities like Ottawa with the Rideau Canal. By having a weir on it, we slow down the pace of water so that you could actually freeze it and then do some things. You could actually skate from Fort Edmonton to downtown. Just imagine being able to do that. Thank you.